Good afternoon, dear Brandeis friends. I am Tammy Weintraub, co-chairman with Rhoda Greif of the Gotham Chapter Study Group Learning Opportunities Committee. We are so happy to welcome you to Gotham Chapter's talk on climate change by Dr. Rob Sokolow. We have about 250 people joining us. That's quite amazing. It's a sign of how important the topic is and how excellent our speaker is. But I hope you are social distancing. Rob has a PhD in theoretical physics, wow, from Harvard, wow. He's been a professor at Princeton University, another wow, since 1971, when he was recruited by Princeton to invent an interdisciplinary environmental research program. He has done very innovative research, partnering with colleagues in his own and related fields. He has won many awards and is a member, often sitting on the board, of many respected scientific organizations. I won't list them, as that would take too much time away from Rob's talk. Rob looks forward to answering your questions and he will weave them into his talk. You can keep sending them in. To send in a question, you click the Q and A box on the bottom of the screen, and then type in your question in the big space to the right of the screen. Please forgive us if we don't have time for your particular question. We will answer as many as we can. So I um, thank you for coming, and I give you ta-ta, Dr. Rob Sokolow. Thank you very much. And thank you, the audience, for setting aside an hour for a discussion of climate change. The subject has been relegated to a backseat over the past few months, as first COVID-19 and then minority rights have demanded our attention. You can only pay attention to a small number of subjects at the same time. But climate change is still there. You and I share an interest in the flourishing of Brandeis. My sister went there a member of my PhD thesis committee with a professor there, and some extraordinary alumni continually cross my path. Thank you for your past and future support of Brandeis. I hope we can communicate successfully on Zoom. I'm used to watching the faces of the people I am talking to. I miss that. I know that it isn't easy for a participant in a Zoom event to stay engaged for a whole hour. I'm hoping to hold your attention by breaking the conversation into two parts. We will talk first about how we know there is a climate problem and why it isn't dangerous. Then we will talk about what we can do to slow climate change down. I hope when you submit questions through the question slot, as Tammy, Tammy just instructed you, please let Tammy know whether your question is for the first part, the problem, or the second part, solutions. The first part will have three elements. Introductory remarks, when I will be on your screen, as now a few slides where I share my screen, and an interval where Tammy and I discuss a few of your questions about the problem. The second part will just have slides and a Q&A about solutions, and maybe we'll pull it all together. I tried very hard when I was an undergraduate to learn every big idea that was out there. That was presumptuous, but that's what I was doing. Then when I was 30, I asked myself which ideas I had missed. Two ideas stood out, gender, from pronouns to fairness, and the global environment. By the global environment, I mean one big counterintuitive, amazing idea, that human beings are able to change the planet at global scale, doing ordinary things. This has not been true for very long. Only very recently have human actions been sufficient to deplete fisheries on a global scale, make the surface oceans noticeably more acidic and to change the global atmosphere significantly. The Anthropocene is a new word, many of you know it, means the geological period when human actions dominate many global scale phenomena. We never were in an Anthropocene before, we were puny, those of us on the planet, our forebears on the planet. The Anthropocene has already started. And this message is not welcome. The messenger is being shot. The messenger of bringing a radical idea has been shot before. Galileo argued that the earth wasn't at the center of the universe. And he was excommunicated. Darwin argued that human beings were part of the animal kingdom. 
and he was cruelly mocked. The idea that humans can't change our planet is as out of date and wrong as the Earth-centered universe and a separate creation of man. But all three ideas have such appeal that they will fade away only very slowly. The task we are passing to the young people on this planet, the next generation, the Brandeis students right now, is to figure out how to fit how to fit on this small planet. Now I want to I want to uh, show you a few slides. The first slide, very often when people talk about this subject, is slaughter what is called the blue marble. The entire Earth seen from space. It turns out that the last time that image was possible for a human being to take was in 1972, with one of the last of the Apollo flights, got far enough away from Earth to be able to see the entire thing. Um, and, and it actually shows at the top of, of that's actually a, a cyclone that was, had been in damaging India just a couple of days before. It's one of the most reproduced images in human history. And what are its messages? Why is it so powerful? The Earth is our home and we are alone in space. It is beautiful and we are responsible for it. Something in the late 60s as we showed our, saw ourselves in this fashion that brought along, brought along something called environmentalism. I was caught up in that wave and devoted my career to the of environmentalism ever since. I'm going to show you a poster child slide that you may not know, maybe you will not know, which tells a story of the human impact on the environment. This is a graph of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 1958 till now. We are at this month or last month, at a couple of months back, a record uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's been climbing steadily, relentlessly. And it goes up and down as well. The, the parts per the, it's 417 parts per million. What does that mean? It means that when you breathe in air right now, about 417 molecules, every million molecules you're breathing are carbon dioxide. If you're indoors, maybe it's built up a little bit. If you're outdoors, that's a pretty good number. It's rising and rising and going up and down because the atmosphere is exchanging carbon dioxide with the forest and the plant. Uh, it goes down when the forests are growing because carbon dioxide is going from the atmosphere into the trees. And in the other half of the year, leaves are decaying on the forest floor and the carbon concentration, carbon dioxide concentration goes up. We had no idea that this was going on. Uh, a very, it's called the Keeling curve because a guy named Charles David Keeling uh, decided he could make measurements on them. And I'll show you where this was taking place. Um, here's the laboratory where this was happening. It's on the top of, nearly on the top of a mountain called Mauna Loa in Hawaii, which is one of a pair of mountains you're looking across to Mauna Kea. Roughly the same height. On Mauna Kea, they do astronomy. On Mauna Loa, they do earth science. They, the land underneath is volcanic. 2007, I made a pilgrimage to that place, hosted by Peter Tans, who is a people who was at the center of the climate data story. If you look closely between us, is the very same curve I was show, showing you in bronze. Um, the other slide that introduced climate science, which is two pictures is this amazing story from about the same time period, a little later, people were able to drill cores into the ice in both Antarctica and Greenland, going straight down. And as you go down, you're going into the past because the snow has, the, has been layered onto the, onto the uh, ice sheet, as it's called, and more and more compressed. And it turns out that in Antarctica only, you can go back 800,000 years, which is what that record below looks like, on the left, you see a piece of an ice core. Up and down, up and down as we go into this last period here is the last ice age. And when it's lowest, that's the coldest uh, it gets. And then we come out of an ice age and it gets warmer. The carbon dioxide concentration is measurable because it's trapped in the bubbles in that ice. Just like eating a tree ring, the bubbles actually can tell you how much carbon dioxide was. And it tracks the temperature amazingly closely. Again, nobody really expected that. They'll put a story together. 
This is the ice ages, and here's the carbon dioxide concentration today at the 417 parts per million, completely out of range of the history of the planet in the last 800,000 years, way outside of that range. Hotter than it's higher than it's ever been in amazing in a very long time, much longer than 800,000 years. Um, so that's what the ice, that's what a piece of a Greenland ice looks like. This work is done by real human beings. It's not, it's a story of, of science in the making. This particular piece from Greenland is a million years old and it's brown because of the dirt. Why do we care? Well, what comes with this climbing, climbing carbon dioxide concentration is higher temperatures. Higher temperatures than melt ice. We have a lot of ice on the planet. As the ice melts, the ocean rises. We don't know how fast this will happen. One of the things I want you to come away with is we know a lot of climate science, but we don't know everything we would like to know. We in particular don't know how fast bad outcomes will come. So we are dealing with risk management or with hedging. The, Florida, the four pictures of Florida and the Gulf Coast here show different amounts of sea level rise and what parts of the land will go under. And you can see that 24 feet of sea level rise will essentially cut the bottom half of the Florida Peninsula out, flood it all, including all of the major settlements on the east coast of Miami and Palm Beach on the west coast of Naples. All that is gone at three feet it's nibbling at it. How much will the sea level rise will there be by 2100? A sort of round number people come up with is three feet, but they don't know. It could be six. It could be one. Three is a good, and, and a reference a reference rate is about three feet per century. Um, there's a lot of ice in Greenland. If you lost it all, you would get 20 feet of sea level rise. Separately from West Antarctic, sheet as it's called, you would get about the same amount, 15 feet of sea level rise if you lost it all. So that looms over us. My colleague Steve Pakala calls this problem the monsters behind the door, the worst credible climate outcomes. So far, no monster has opened its door. Climate scientists simply don't know how close we are to when one of them will do so, which is called a tipping point. So with these few slides, I hope I've introduced you to uh, so a, a whiff, if you like, of climate science. It's not built on sand. It's got very specific uh, science behind it growing all the time. Now, Tammy and I are going to take a first set of questions on the problem. I hope we haven't been too fast here. Uh, you have sent in a few. And when Tammy comes on the screen with me, um, we will have, she, she and I will have a little conversation about her question. Um, are, we, are we there? Tammy? Coming, coming. <laughs> good, good. Great, hi. So, um, you want me to start feeding you some questions? Are you hungry? <laughs> fire, fire away, or seed okay. away. So let's see. Um, somebody was wondering how climate change would affect natural disasters, such as earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, etc. What will climate change do to these? Yeah, good. Really important question. The monsters I was referring to include some of those, but not others. People talking about monsters are worried about sea level rise, as I mentioned, major losses of forest, the possibility of gases emerging, emerging from the ice in the Arctic in particular, and then adding to the carbon dioxide and giving you a kind of runaway and then especially effects on the, on the um, hydrological cycle, on the water, water and the weather. Routes and floods definitely will have lots of disruption of that kind. Major storms and hurricanes, maybe even affecting our ocean currents like the Gulf Stream. But climate does not affect earthquakes as far as we know and the tsunamis that come with the earthquakes. Extraction of fluids from below ground, however, which is another human activity, pumping oil and gas out, pumping water and maybe someday carbon dioxide in, they can trigger earthquakes if, in the, if put in the wrong place and done in a poor fashion. So that indeed we can interact with earthquakes, just not through climate change. As far as tornadoes are concerned, as far as I know, we just don't understand them. We don't know whether we can affect them. So we have all kinds of levels of, of, of scientific understanding. How about a second question, Tammy?
So I'm not sure if she's still joining us, but let me read you a question that I just saw from the Q&A. Okay. This is from Barry, and the, and the question is, according to the Yale survey, 66% of Americans favor putting a price on carbon. Do you agree with this approach as a best first step, including refunding the proceeds in the form of a dividend? It's a question that really belongs in the second half, Alex. Um, I'd rather, if you have any questions that bear directly on the science and the problem, we could come back to it. Sure, let me, let me look again. Uh, what is the primary cause of the increase in carbon dioxide? Good. Okay, so there's a, there's, a, there's a number one and there's a number two that are pretty clear cut. Number one is burning coal, oil, and gas that we bring out from below ground. They have carbon in them. They would never have come to the surface. With the ingenuity of 150 years, we are bringing very large quantities of carbon, of carbon to, the to the surface. We burn it and get energy out, which drives our cars and runs our machinery and makes electricity. And the carbon dioxide doesn't actually all stay in the atmosphere, about half of it does. And then the other half goes into the oceans or into making forests bigger. Both actually happen. When this carbon dioxide goes into the oceans, they become more acidic. The number two is cutting down forests. If we transfer carbon from the forest to the atmosphere, we have fewer forests, we have more carbon in the atmosphere. That is about a quarter as big today as the burning of fossil fuels. They both have to come way down in order to, in order to take control of the climate. So I have another one here. What, what percentage carbon, this is from Jeff, what percentage carbon in the air is attributable to anthropogenic activities? Well, okay, so a number I didn't tell you is that in 1800 and 400, Hundreds of years before, as best we can figure out, not perfectly, but pretty well, there were about 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. The curve I showed you started at 317. So there was a 280 parts per million have been in the atmosphere in some kind of an equilibrium, ocean and land and forest without any of our help. And we've been adding to that. And we have added about 40% to the original number, so about 30% of the total, 40% added on what we had. That's what's coming from people right now, and it's climbing about half a percent per year. It hasn't really stopped growing at about that rate. In spite of the concern for climate, we haven't turned it into actions that are changing them, that are slowing the climb down, never mind turning it over. Here's another one from Michael. How will climate change affect freshwater availability in arid areas? Well, it's inter the words arid areas are critical. There's, there seems to be a rule coming from the climate science models that wet gets wet, wetter and dry gets drier. You might prefer it the other way, but it means that where there are drought stricken areas, the droughts could well get worse. And where there is heavy rainfall, it could be even more heavy. That means essentially worse droughts and worse floods. Overall, the planet will have more rainfall than it does now because as the air gets warmer, it can hold more water. And then so we will have an, a wetter planet, but not necessarily wetter where we would like it to be wetter. And here's another one. What is the role of methane in climate change? Complicated question and a good one. It's the number two gas after carbon dioxide in warming the planet. It is increasing because of what people are doing on the planet. That includes not just burning stuff, and because methane can leak from a natural gas system, but it includes probably how we're handling agriculture and animals. Carbon dioxide, is, uh, methane, sorry, is produced uh, from cattle. Actually, it's the belch of the cattle. It's produced on the, on the, rice, on the rice paddy floor. It's produced whenever we add swamps. And we are, we, we're see it's more than doubled, much higher percentage rise than for carbon dioxide. And we really don't understand it in, in great detail, the, the methane cycle. We, are less, we, less, we understand it less well than carbon dioxide. So as not to run out of time, Alex, suppose I go back to the slides and go into the second half. Is that okay or do you wanna ask me one more? Uh, we can do one more. So another okay. one from Jeff, is there any developing technology that would remove carbon from the air? 
I've got that in the second part also. Okay, and that's the answer is the answer is yes, and I, I that happens to be one of the subjects I work on. Okay, let me try to go back to the slides. Um, and um, so we should be we should be over over here. And are you indeed, Alex, seeing my seeing my screen? Yes. Good. So I talk about what we can do about climate change. Sometimes I show a slide which I call the Seder plate. I haven't shown it in a while. For some reason, this audience brought it back to mind. Well, we go around the six uh, side dishes of the Seder plate, and we have six ways of solving the climate problem in part. We would do all of them in some fashion or another. So let's start at 12 o'clock. We have never really taken energy efficiency to anything close to its potential. Buildings are built with lots of leaks. Appliances are, could be made much lower energy demand. As we all know, our cars could get much higher miles per gallon. And it turns out, turns out that an industry where sometimes more attention is paid to, to energy because it's a cost of production, still a, a steel mill or coal or a um, a steel mill or a chemical plant or paper mill will use much more energy than it would otherwise need to. So the number one strategy, which has been at staring at us for a very long time, is to get systematically serious with measurement, with policy incentives on energy efficiency. The number two, and this is the exciting newcomer, wasn't there as an important option 20 years ago, was is that solar and wind power have come them way down. I'll be saying some more about them in a minute. As you all know, they are, they are variable, and so they don't really do our bidding until we add a lot of energy storage so we can put the power in when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing and get it back out. When, um, when the wind is blowing less, they make electricity. And so one of the things that is going into the package, package for dealing with climate change is to make more things electric that are not electric now. Um, so jumping to six o'clock for a moment, making vehicles electric only works for as a carbon strategy, a climate strategy, if, if the um, electricity is produced without producing a lot of carbon. So a solar and wind energy system with electric vehicles gets your carbon dioxide emissions out of the transport sector, but not otherwise. The question I, I told you I'd come back to here is right, is at four o'clock because natural gas and even coal can be used to make electricity in a climate friendly way if the carbon dioxide that is emitted from the fuel is captured from the typically on in the flue gas on the way to the atmosphere, not allowed to reach the atmosphere and taken somewhere else, typically pumped below ground. I don't have on here a, a related strategy where the carbon dioxide comes from the air with similar chemical capture and it put below ground. That is harder to do by a lot, but it is a, an additional strategy. You may want to come back to that. At eight o'clock, as I said before, a lot of the carbon dioxide is going to the atmosphere and cutting down forests, but in principle, we can grow new forests and we can find plants with deep roots that, that gradually built up carbon dioxide, carbon, not carbon dioxide, in the soils. And in both of those strategies, we're building, we're basically transferring carbon from the atmosphere to below ground. So that's an important strategy too. And at 10 o'clock, a whole set of questions about what we want from life, how much travel we want to do, how much consumption is important to us, and think, what do we, how do we, what is our diet? What do we want to eat? The lifestyle on this planet of eight, of eight billion people living like Americans, in principle, can be accomplished with a lot of technology but it sure gets easier if in some way or another we find ways to ease off, ease up on the demands we make from our lifestyles. Very controversial. Young people are challenging the way we live with older folk. How will that play out? In the middle, you have this thing I call the stabilization triangle. And these numbers, 35, 7, and 70. Well, 30, this is the, in millions of, sorry, billions of tons of carbon dioxide emitted per year in the atmosphere, to the atmosphere. 
at this, at this time on the left, we are putting about 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning coal, oil, and gas. And that number has been steadily going up. 70 is what's called sometimes business as usual. We pay no attention to climate at all. The economy keeps growing. Developing countries develop on with fossil fuels. Doubling the carbon dioxide con emission rate in 50 years is quite credible. What, what is the challenge we're, we're demanding of ourselves? It's essentially to get most of that fossil energy emission out of the economy in 50 years, maybe down to one tenth of what it would otherwise be. So for solar power, I've got three images here um, because they're three very different applications. What I find somehow technologically exciting is they all use the same panel coming out of the same factory, more or less. So the left-hand panel is, a, is centralized solar, huge areas, multi, hundreds of acres, maybe thousands of acres of, of solar panels on, on a kind of support, tilted, maybe packing the sun, maybe not. This one is in China, but there's similar fields, solar fields as they're called in the southwest of the US in, de in the desert. A very large fraction of the solar contribution to a low carbon economy will come from facilities like this. Very different are the panels on the roof of a middle class home all over the world, south facing or flat, um, capable of producing quite a lot of energy all by themselves. This can also be on commercial buildings or rooftops of warehouses and things of that sort. Um, adding a different kind of, with a different sort of tech, uh, social interface People have to want them, use them, take care of them one at a time, and they have to be part, they have to connect the utility typically. And third is the is the one on the bottom right, the same solar panels, one and two at a time, are making an enormous difference to the world's poor. Um, the that panel will produce probably to a small battery. It might even be an old fashioned lead acid battery. Will produce um, electricity for a few lights for the nighttime, perhaps for a refrigerator to keep some medicine cold, a really small one, and for, and for charging a cell phone. And with those three changes, the life of that person living in the family living in New York might be entirely different. Um, and so there, all three of these impacts of solar are coming with this dramatic, amazing reduction in cost that is making us all far more optimistic about it, our ability to deal with climate change than ever before. As far as wind is concerned, there's lots of things to say. This is a pair of offshore wind actually in, in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Germany and the, and the Netherlands and, and Denmark all have offshore wind and Britain. Uh, we are just building the first, we have exactly one wind, wind farm offshore right now, but a tremendous interest in the northeastern states about building sites that will look like this. And the very interesting question that I can leave with the audience to discuss over the dinner table tonight, is this ugly or beautiful? We've had a lot of trouble sighting offshore wind when this is dimly on the horizon, but it's there. And if you go out to a boat, you might, it might dominate your landscape. We've had a hard time with the sighting of offshore wind turbines. We have a hard time sighting onshore wind turbines. They make a little, some noise. Um, they can kill birds. They are not totally benign. They are partnered with solar in people's minds. Costs have dropped dramatically. They're much larger as a unit. The solar panel has to be about 10 acres to equal the electricity that's going to be produced from one of these turbines. And, uh, sorry, about 50 acres. And so, the, and so they have a somewhat different story, but they are part of that future too. We have to connect those solar and wind turbines with infrastructure. So that picture is a Rorschach test on the left. It's the US highway system. What do you see there? You see at one level an amazing success of a federal program able to impose a single vision over several decades that was first on a piece of paper. We also see trucks displacing uh, rail. 
we see uh, sometimes we look more closely some of those eyes of disrupted cities and disrupted uh, they came in cities. I'm thinking of New Haven. Many, many roles, but we have to do something similar in scale and impact to deal with a climate change. We will probably have a, 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 we have to overhaul our electricity system, although we can keep a different story. We certainly can keep the system. We don't have to get rid of it. But we have to add on top of it other systems. Let me show you one more picture first. This is a similar picture of what the power plants of the country look like, where red is coal, yellow is natural, is, is nuclear, blue is natural gas, and it's somewhat out of date. In this case, we're not talking about adding to it. We're talking about swapping it out for solar and wind, lots of solar plants in the Southwest, lots of wind farms. The strongest wind is, as you may not know, right in the middle of the country, or the vertical, right at, at, to the east of the Rockies, where the wind has had a chance to build up over flat land, and pump it, piping that in with electricity all the way to the East Coast, all the way to the West Coast, all the way to the South, Southeast, uh, with electric power lines, possibly a carbon dioxide park, uh, pipeline system as well to take the carbon dioxide from gas plants that do capture the CO2 and put it in places where it can be used or put below ground, because the best places to put below ground are typically where oil and gas were produced. So the industries have a new role, but they're not everywhere. And we might have an infrastructure for hydrogen. So it's a tremendous challenge, this low carbon world, but these are the principal elements of it, wind and solar and a new, and, and, and new infrastructure, the, the national scale. Around the world, it's a pretty similar story. And not every place has the solar and wind endowments that we have. Um, so there, there may be hydrogen that's moved from one part of the world to another because people are less well endowed. Um, if you add the carbon capture and storage option in most parts of the world, you can take care of things. Uh, a solution that is often on people's minds in my field, but that many of you have not heard of, called solar geoengineering. That's a picture of an explosion of a volcano in the Philippines in 1991. The large, no volcano, no volcano that large has exploded since. Although there were many volcanoes before, that were much larger than that in historical time and in geological time, of course, many more. But in the early 1800s, there was an explosion of Krakatoa in Indonesia, much larger. But this was big enough to lower the temperature of the planet for about a year, cooled it off by about a degree Fahrenheit. Um, and the reason is that it was big enough to loft particles into the stratosphere, the highest part of the atmosphere. And in the stratosphere, particles stay a long time. They don't immediately out because it's act, word stratus means it's layered. It's not very turbulent up there. And those particles were, were, refl were reflecting sunlight. When they reflected sunlight, less sunlight warmed the planet, and that's what cooled, cooled us down. Gradually, they settled out in about a year to two, and the planet went back to its initial state. People noticing this with an engineering disposition say, well, we can do this but on, on purpose by lofting particles into the stratosphere with either aircraft or balloons or rockets in, very, in quantities that are not so immense that it would break the bank. And we can layer those particles out. They will fall out. So we have to keep doing them, doing this over, over and over again. Every week, you're putting more, more particles in. Some are settling out. You, mimic, you call it a perpetual volcano. And do we want to do this? There are many people who are, do not believe, in my field, that they do not believe that we're going to be successful with the solar wind infrastructure story I just gave you, or we won't get it done soon enough. And so they are, they are urging that this, we get on with this alternative, plan B, if you like, uh, the, which, which many others just roll their eyes when they hear about it. Do we really want to take charge of the planet? There's a philosophical question there. Can we make this work? Can we learn, well, can we learn enough about it before we actually do it that we don't find out that we got it wrong? And how on earth would we have, a, how on earth, 
would be governed if this were how, if this were our strategy. I show it here in part as a dangerous strategy for sure, but really all the strategies one can think of have their own dangers. If you do, if you do, and, and so we have to be vigilant about all of them. Okay, so when I think about this and try to generalize, what are we actually dealing with here? We're not dealing with a short-term problem, but we're also dealing with an unfamiliar problem. And I've been struck with how much we have learned in my academic career about the past, the deep past. The left on left hand picture shows the total universe with its structure that we have learned from satellites measuring the infrared radiation coming at us from space. In the in the 1960s, we learned a lot about how the planets, uh, how the how the continents were formed, and how the Earth has developed over its own history. That's a picture of what's called seafloor spreading. That explains why Africa and South America could kind of kind of fit together when you look around. And the right-hand picture is DNA. We learned how the genetics work. We learned about our heredity. Immense achievements. And but we have not put our mind to the future. It's not the same kind of thinking. But we have, nor have we really defined until now what it means to think about a collective future for humankind. We've thought about individual futures, national futures, but there's something new going on, which is to understand the fate of the species, our collective future. And I call that destiny studies. I think we're nibbling at it, but there won't be long before, especially given the level of interest we have from young people, there'll be a program in destiny studies at many universities. How soon at Brandeis? I bet within a decade. I'm an optimist. What, why? Well, the world has a terribly inefficient energy system. There's room to make it a lot better. The costs for solar power and wind power have fallen precipitously. We have lots of new construction ahead of us. We're not stuck, especially the rest of the world. The developed world is Europe, US, Japan is more stuck than India, China, Africa because they have all of their construction ahead and they can do it right. And very smart young people now find climate and energy problems exciting. That's my number one reason. It wasn't true 20 years ago that people could, could wanted to this, consider this a, a major thing they could commit their careers to. Enrollments were not large in department majors called environment. Now they are. So with that upbeat moment, I hope we can turn to the next set of questions and I will I will be again available for Alex or Tammy to ask some more. Hello. Hi, Rob. Um, Tammy's still unable to join us, but so we have a lot of questions here, 18 right now, but I was thinking- We're not gonna I, get through 18 because I think we wanna stop at, at four o'clock, right? Of course, so I was thinking I can- You I could can have a vote, them. how many wanna to go to five o'clock, but I think we should- <laughs> Okay. So let's, let's group a few together because I think there's some similar topics here. Um, so there's one question that I'm seeing how will this affect international relations? There was another question about how important is the Paris Treaty and US participation? And then a third uh, that talks about how much damage has been done by the climate policy uh, by the, in the Trump administration. Is the damage re reversible and how long will it take? Certainly our related questions. Hello, Tammy, welcome back. You're, uh, you're muted, Tammy. You're, you're muted. Hello. Say hello. Hi. Sorry, everybody. Go ahead. <laughs> You're aware that Alex has been subbing for you. Yes, I'm most appreciative. Okay. So the U.S. has been a bull in the China shop for the last three years, as far as global agreements are concerned in general. And one of the most uh, peculiar self-defeating step steps was to withdraw from the, what's called the Paris Treaty. Um, we haven't actually withdrawn, we just notified the world that we would withdraw, and I believe that withdrawal, we had a, we had a three-year waiting time, and it just ends at about election day, within a couple of weeks of election day. Um, the Paris Agreement was an achievement of the diplomats of an extraordinary sort. Many people thought nothing like that could be done. Um, 
Obama and some of the staff worked extremely hard to first get a relate, an agreement between China and the US that we would both acknowledge that climate change was a national priority. And on the back of that bilateral agreement, the world came along with a lot of initiative by world's diplomats besides American, aside from American and Chinese. Uh, I call the Paris Agreement a, a potluck dinner. The idea is that everything is voluntary, but that everything is, but everybody's, and, and, but that it's, and it's gonna get better and better. Each country brings what's called a nationally determined contribution voluntarily to an international process, which would have been this past year has been postponed to next year. They, this will be a set of policies they've instated to bring about a more efficient car or perhaps uh, reduce travel in, in cities or improve their buildings. And they come and they put it on the table and they say, here's what we're bringing today. Nobody makes fun of it. Nobody makes fun of what you bring to a potluck dinner. They compliment you, they encourage you. You spend your time looking at some of the other dishes. You say, I could do that, I could practice that. And the idea is that three years later, you come back, everybody comes back with the next set of nationally determined contributions. It's called a race to the top. It's, it's a clever idea. It probably can work, but the, it cannot work if a major emitter starts saying, well, I'm, I'm gonna stay home. Uh, and that's what's happening right now. First, it is the world's credit that for the most part, people said, stay home, we don't need you. But that's wearing a bit thin. I don't know that would survive four more years of saying that. But if we rejoin, we have stories to tell, and more stories if we get to work. So I think the Paris Agreement is tremendously important. Now, um, the question was, so why is it especially important now? because the, the biggest decisions being made now that have impact on climate are actually not in America, except because of our influence on others. But in a country like India, it's up for grabs right now. The policymakers are trying to find their way through the, the choice between building on uh, industrializing at a very large scale, cities and highways on the basis of coal and oil or on the basis of wind and solar. Uh, wind and solar is not as, as easy to do, probably more expensive for a, a while, but the world should be focusing on their, those decisions. We focus on those decisions through international, through international processes. We should, it does matter to us, the choices that India makes, as well as Africa, as well as Latin America. China is well along and is thinking with us. And, and, uh, it may be that we need to help with technology, we need to help with money, investment, and it, and it may be that, but above all, we need to listen and understand their issues. It's not on our radar screen, which I think is really quite, that was quite serious. Alex, did I pick, there were a couple of more aspects of that question that I think I may have left. So you touched on, you touched on the Paris Agreement, uh, the Trump policies, how much damage have those inflicted? Yep. And I've, I've said all that. Was there another part of the question or should we go on to another one? We could go on to another one. Tammy, do you want to pick the question? Sure. And I hope this, I hope this wasn't asked while I was away. <clears throat> um, how will climate change affect our food and water supply? And how will it affect migration? Good. No, I, we didn't talk about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Whenever we talk about climate change affecting something, I worry that we're going to kid ourselves because there are always other cofactors that may, sometimes may be even more important. And it's kind of a bandwagon to say this is due to climate change. But climate change contributes many effects. So let's take, let's take a drought. Or, or, um, we build a dam we change the flows of rivers. We put in irrigation, increasing the yields of agriculture. We may re we reduce the flows of water down the river. The Colorado is a 
now now ends up dry by the time that it, it goes into the into the Gulf into the uh, Gulf California. And um, nonetheless, climate change, if it melts the ice in the, the snow or changes the snowpack in the Rockies, will reduce the flow down the Colorado River or change its timing, probably both. Um, so hydrology is affected by climate change for sure. That can affect food supply. That can affect floods and storms, as I said. Um, then there's the question about migration. Again, we can expect that people who are confronting environmental uh, consequences in their environments are going to try to try or are going to leave, move. Migration is partially caused by climate change, but it's a very substantial role is rising expectations and the ability for some young person in a poor area to find his or her way to a wealthier area, earn enough money to send money home. That's a tremendous pull. And large family size, which means there are too many people, there, there, there's not enough employment for the people who are young and able, so they move on. Climate change contributes to what are called environment, environmental refugees, but we really can miss a full picture if we're not careful. That's how I would answer that question, Tammy. Is that, will that do? That's good. You have, do we have time for one more? Um, we have, a, I think, for a few more, actually. Okay, good. So how about this? Um, what can we learn from how the Earth has been different during the pandemic? We're certainly using less energy. Yeah, that is, that is an interesting question, indeed. We're doing, there's every, once in a while, because of human events, we have a, 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 an experiment being done to our, to our planet that we are essentially controlling with a power blackout of, I forget what, how many years back in the Northeast US we had uh, visible effects on the environment. Now we have a bigger one. The, the carbon dioxide concentra uh, emission rate has dropped by about 10%, I think in the last year. Not more than that, but substantial, all the same in the past couple of months. Um, which I knew that maybe 15. And um, so there are gonna be noticeable signals, not easy to find. The carbon, the, that keeling curve of going up and down and climbing will hardly show it. Um, but there may be some rainfall patterns that will reflect the diff the, 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 this diff these differences. We certainly, so I, I, I think what I, what I decided to do is put it into three categories. For sure, we're seeing improvements in, in air quality. There, what's, there are things that are very reversible, there are things that are not at all reversible, and things are partially reversible. Fully reversible is the air quality of a, of a city. Los Angeles used to have a terrible air. We got control of the emissions power plants and cars and so forth, changed the cars with catalytic converters, and we, and we made the air as good as it had been, if I'm not mistaken. But many cities have not been cleaned up and they're experiencing a cleaning up right now that is presumably loved in many of those cities. Um, then as far as irreversible would be species loss. If you have from climate change, um, Loss of habitat, again, human actions unrelated to climate change can play a big role. Hunting, uh, the passage of passenger pigeon to extinction in the 19th century. Um, and then, and then the, partially, the partially reversible, I think maybe we'll, we may stop with this, is to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bring it back to its present level. There was a question that alluded to that. It is possible to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by growing trees that they weren't there before, yes. It turns out with vegetation strategies alone, I think you can't get anywhere near all the way. You're essentially taking as much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, as much carbon in that carbon dioxide as you took carbon into the atmosphere by fossil fuel industry over a whole century. And that's just an immense amount. But you can use chemicals and blow air over chemicals and make, uh, and capture the carbon dioxide and pump it below ground and do very an enormous industry for more than a century and not starting for the next several decades because it's not as it's not sensible to do it while we still have fossil fuels in the energy system 
it's possible to imagine 2200 getting down to an atmosphere like today. So it's partially responsible, it's partially reversible, but it's, it's not really part of what we need to be focusing on at this time. It's fascinating, people like the idea that they can get it done. I think it's important that we know we could get it done, but it's not at all a first or second order of business. Here's one more that is so typical. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, that we, we always say things come down to dollars and cents. So somebody asks, how would a carbon tax, a tax on carbon, help as a tool to reduce I'm so glad you got back to that because it's the question I punted on or rather postponed in the first part. I didn't punt, I knew I wanted to get back to it. I remembered that just now. So a favorite policy of economists and one that's discussed a lot in national capitals is to make fossil fuels more expensive so people use less of them and so that the competitors are more attractive. Be very careful about any conversation about a carbon price that doesn't include some conversation about how high the tax is going to be. A lot of, there's a fear on my part that a token tax will make people feel as if they're doing something about climate change and will not actually drive much change of technology. The states, the Eastern states of the US have such a token tax right now called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. It just about pays for the product that people who administer it. It was kept low because people didn't, don't want disruption. You can't make it high in instantly. A number to have in mind is $100 per ton of CO2. $10 is token, $100 is a big impact. You would ramp up to 100, maybe over as much as 10 years, maybe five in steady increments. And you would have investments that reflected that. It would really happen. One of the most important things though is to, is to have, a, have it credible that it will not get reversed. In Australia, they went flip-flop, on, off, on, off, because they changed, they changed government several times. No investor is going to invest in something that come and go. So a commitment to a carbon policy that, that takes, has 55% of the senators is just not robust enough. We really have to be planning. We, have, we have, should have as our expectation that we can make the case for climate change credible enough, earnest enough, uh, sympathetic enough to the reasons why people are concerned about it, that we can get the 70% commitment to making something happen with climate change that we need. This is in the America and it's in the world. We can't think of this as, as some kind of 50 yard line that battle. Um, that's just not gonna work. Just because there are strong policies that would make a difference and they have to be convincing to get the investments to make a difference. So Tammy, I'll stop there. I think we're close to the to, to the, um, I know you want to say a few things to wrap up. You have four minutes. Okay. Um, There's such a good one here. Can I ask you one more question? <laughs> sure. Go for it. If I can answer, I'll try to be very brief. Somebody says, very brief, that that natural gas gets thrown in with all this. But perhaps do we need natural gas as a bridge if we're getting rid of other energy? That is a 20-minute question, not a two-minute okay. question. Well, that would be However, enough. the answer is... I'm intrigued with natural gas plus capture and storage, which does allow you to, and it would be a second, a more advanced form of natural gas. If we do need it now, it is a good complement to solar and wind. And I think it is a good idea to think of this as a bridge strategy. Okay, Rob, thank you so very, very much. And thank you, our audience, for joining with us. Please forgive us if we didn't have time to answer all the questions. Rob, you've done a great, great job. Um, we at Gotham are making a small donation to the Brandeis Library, which will go towards the purchase of a learned research journal in your honor. <laughs> and um, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, and uh, we just thank you so much for joining us. We hope we'll and a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for coming. <laughs>